Let's journey back into the roaring 1920s, a dark chapter in American history, an era when the nation was swept by a wave of intoxication, illicit bars, and underground dealings. These awful times gave power to an ultimate city shaker and a notorious gangster, Al Capone, who ruled and operated a highly organized crime empire in Chicago. The infamous gangster, who was also known as the Scarface, changed the fate of American history with his swagger and notoriety. Despite orchestrating a series of murders, gang wars, and violent acts during his reign, authorities quaked in fear to confront him. No law enforcement could even dare to touch him. But you would be rather shocked to discover that this powerful gangster was once a common man who rose from the streets of Brooklyn and became the ruler of Chicago. So what is the real story of Al Capone? How did a common man like him rise to power? What were his crimes and did he pay any price for his ruthlessness? Brace yourselves as we are going to find all the answers and dig deeper into the untold story of Al Capone, which is about to blow your mind. Birth and early life. The story of Capone begins when a young immigrant couple, Gabriele and Teresina Capone, migrated from Italy to settle in the bustling streets of Brooklyn in New York. Their story was similar to all those families who had migrated to America, seeking a brighter future in a new land. Gabriele and Teresina soon gave birth to Alphonse Capone, who entered their lives in 1899 as a fourth child. His name was Alphonse Capone, but no one had any idea that this young boy would later become infamously known as Al Capone or Scarface. The Capone family was like any other immigrant family of their time, his father, Gabriele, made a living as a barber, while his mother, Teresina, dedicated herself to raising their children. Education was important for the family, but financial realities often forced immigrant children to leave school prematurely to contribute to the family's income. Al Capone, too, walked this path, staying in school until the age of 14. Despite showing great performance in his academics, his rebellious nature clashed with the strict rules of his parochial Catholic school. His education came to an abrupt end after he was expelled for a shocking incident, striking a female teacher squarely in the face. With school behind him, Al Capone ventured into the world of work, taking up a series of odd jobs to make ends meet. Between 1916 and 1918, he even dabbled in semi-professional baseball, displaying a talent that extended beyond the streets. But Feite had other plans for young Capone. It was during the same time that he crossed paths with a figure who would profoundly influence his life, the notorious gangster Johnny Torrio. To Capone, Torrio became more than a mere acquaintance. He became a mentor setting him on a path that was all set to shape the course of history. It is odd to notice that Capone had neither a troubled childhood nor a broken family. He had a decent family. But his decision to become a crime boss comes as a surprise. As his life progressed, Al Capone's journey led him to the mean streets of Brooklyn, where he joined the ranks of a street gang known as the South Brooklyn Rippers. Later, he found himself amidst the Five Points Juniors, another group of teenagers navigating the urban landscape. His early life experiences during these days were marked with territorial disputes, defending their turf against rival gangs and occasionally indulging in petty crimes like cigarette theft. These experiences left a heavy impact on his life and paved the way for Capone to become one of the most famous crime bosses of America. The Rise of Scarface The question which comes to everyone's mind is, how did a young boy from street crimes make his debut in American politics? Did he have some inside sources? Little by little, Capone was gaining massive attention among his street gang members. During his time with the Five Points Gang, Al Capone caught the attention of a ruthless New York mobster named Frankie Yale. 
As soon as he grabbed his attention, in 1917, at the age of 18, Capone began working at Yale's Harvard Inn. He took on various roles there, from bartender to waiter, and even acting as a bouncer when the need arose. It was here that Capone got an up-close look at how Yale used violence to maintain his control over his criminal domain. One fateful day while working at the Harvard Inn, Capone encountered a man and a woman sitting at a table. When his initial advances were ignored, Capone made an ill-advised remark to the woman saying, Honey, you have a nice ass, and I mean that as a compliment. The man with her happened to be the girl's brother, Frank Galuccio. In defense of his sister's honor, Frank Galuccio punched Capone. But Capone wasn't one to back down easily. He decided to retaliate, and a physical altercation ensued. During the scuffle, Galuccio produced a knife and slashed at Capone's face, leaving three deep cuts, including one that ran from his ear to his mouth. These scars, the result of this violent encounter, would earn Capone the notorious nickname Scarface, a moniker he personally hated. Personal life. Shortly after surviving the violent attack, Al Capone's path crossed with Mary, affectionately known as May Coughlin. May was a pretty blonde girl, hailing from a respectable Irish family with a middle-class background. Love bloomed between May and Capone, and not long after, May found herself expecting a child. In the wake of this life-changing news, Al Capone and May decided to tie the knot on December 2, 1918, a mere three weeks after welcoming their son into the world. Their son, Albert Francis Capone, affectionately known as Sonny, remained Capone's only child. At the time of their marriage, Al Capone was under the age of 21, necessitating written consent from his parents for the union to proceed. Despite the unconventional circumstances surrounding their marriage and Capone's criminal endeavors, by all means, the couple enjoyed a remarkably happy and enduring partnership. Al Capone made a steadfast commitment to keeping his family life and illicit business ventures entirely separate. He proved to be a devoted father and a loving husband, taking extraordinary measures to ensure his family's safety, well-being, and anonymity, far from the harsh glare of the public eye. However, Capone led a double life. Over the years, he maintained a number of extramarital relationships and mistresses. Unbeknownst to him at the time, Capone had contracted syphilis from a prostitute prior to meeting May. The insidious nature of this disease, with symptoms that could vanish quickly, left Capone unaware of its lingering presence and the devastating toll it would eventually take on his health in later years. Foray in Chicago. Life took a turn for Capone when he decided to leave New York and settle in Chicago. Little did he know, this little and seemingly insignificant decision was going to be a life-changing decision of Capone's life. In 1919, Al Capone left his New York City roots behind and headed to Chicago, all thanks to an invitation from Johnny Torrio. Torrio had been brought in by crime boss James Big Jim Colosimo to act as an enforcer. Capone's journey in Chicago commenced with a rather unglamorous role. He worked as a bouncer in a brothel. It's widely believed that it was during this period that he contracted syphilis, likely through intimate contact with one of the workers. A disease which was going to play a crucial role in the final years. It is intriguing that the disease showed no signs when he was in his glory years. But there is another interesting revelation. Surprisingly, Capone was aware of his infection quite early on, and had he sought treatment, it's probable that he could have been cured with the use of salvarsan. Unfortunately, he chose not to seek any further medical help. By 1923, Capone had settled down in Chicago and purchased a modest house in the Park Manor neighborhood for $5,500. At the same time, Capone was involved in the murder of hijacker Joe Howard. 
The incident grabbed a lot of media attention. The Chicago Daily Tribune also reported this significant incident in 1923 when hijacker Joe Howard was killed. It was revealed that Howard had tried to interfere with the Capone Torrio bootlegging business and therefore had to pay a heavy price. In the early 1920s, Capone's name started appearing in the sports pages of newspapers describing his role as a boxing promoter. In the same year, Colosimo, another underworld crime boss, was also killed. This was the second significant murder in the crime world and everyone suspected Capone. However, soon after his murder, Torrio took control of Colosimo's criminal empire. Under Torrio's leadership, an Italian organized crime group, largely the biggest in Chicago, thrived, with Capone serving as his right-hand man. Torrio, however, remained extremely cautious about getting embroiled in gang conflicts and often tried to negotiate territorial agreements among rival crime groups. One such rival group was the North Side Gang, led by Dino Banyan. They faced pressure from the Jenner brothers, who were allied with Torrio. But later on, O'Banion discovered Torrio's uncooperative in dealing with the Genna's encroachment, despite his claims of being a peacemaker. Seems like O'Banion was right. In a significant turn of events, Torrio planned the murder of O'Banion at his flower shop on November 10, 1924. This action elevated Jaime Weiss to the head of the Northside gang, with support from Vincent Drucci and Bugs Moran. Weiss had been a close friend of O'Banion, and seeking revenge on his killers became a top priority for the Northsiders. For the North During the Prohibition era, Capone forged connections with Canadian bootleggers who assisted in smuggling liquor into the United States. When asked about his knowledge of Rocco Perry, known as Canada's King of the Bootleggers, Capone famously quipped, why, I don't even know which street Canada is on. However, some sources suggest that Capone did visit Canada and had hideaways there. Although the Royal Canadian Mounted Police disputes this claim, stating that there is no concrete evidence of his presence on Canadian soil. Boss of the Crime Empire. In the aftermath of the November 1924 murder of Dion O'Banion, a trusted associate of both Torrio and Capone, who had become a liability, Torrio and Capone found themselves in the crosshairs of O'Banion's vengeful allies. With a real and imminent threat to his life, he couldn't live a life in constant fear. That's when Capone decided to take dramatic steps to increase his personal safety. He surrounded himself with a team of vigilant bodyguards and even went as far as acquiring a bulletproof Cadillac sedan. On the other hand, Torrio chose not to make any significant changes to his routine. However, Torrio learned his lesson. In the beginning of 1925, he was subjected to a brutal attack just outside his home. The attack was so severe that Torrio narrowly escaped with his life. Following this life-threatening incident, Torrio took a crucial decision. He chose to retire from the criminal underworld and handed over the reins of his entire organization to Capone in March 1925. Taking over from Torrio, Capone wasted no time in showing the whole world his abilities as a formidable crime boss. His deep understanding of the criminal world under Torrio's mentorship quickly propelled him to success in the world of organized crime. Prominence as a celebrity gangster. In the wake of the 1924 murder of Dion O'Banion, Al Capone's transformation into a celebrity gangster was underway. Capone was not just any criminal. He was a media sensation, a figure who dared to flout the law openly. At just 26 years old, Al Capone found himself at the helm of an expansive criminal empire. This vast organization included a wide array of illicit businesses, brothels, nightclubs, dance halls, racetracks, gambling dens, restaurants, secret speakeasies, breweries, and distilleries. Capone's position as a major crime boss in Chicago thrust him into the public ear. 
In the bustling streets of Chicago, Capone became a flamboyant and unforgettable character. He sported colorful suits, donned a distinctive white fedora hat, and proudly showcased his impressive 11.5 carat diamond pinky ring. Often, he would casually produce a sizable roll of bills while in public, leaving no doubt about his presence. But Al Capone was not just known for his ostentatious style, he was equally renowned for his generosity. He would frequently leave a staggering $100 tip for waiters, and in Cicero, he issued standing orders to distribute coal and clothing to those in need during the harsh winter months. Capone even played a pivotal role in establishing some of the very first soup kitchens during the Great Depression, offering vital assistance to the struggling masses. Countless stories circulated about Capone's acts of personal kindness. Whether it was helping a desperate woman on the brink of turning to prostitution to support her family, or assisting a young student, burdened by the soaring costs of tuition, Capone's generosity knew few bounds. To many, he seemed like a modern-day Robin Hood, distributing wealth and aid to the average citizen in their time of need. He lived a lavish lifestyle that included custom-made suits, expensive cigars, gourmet food, top-shelf drinks, and the company of women. He had a taste for extravagant and expensive jewelry that added to his flamboyant image. When questioned about his activities, Capone had a couple of favorite responses. I am just a businessman, giving the people what they want, and all I do is satisfy a public demand. Capone's way of living and his unapologetic attitude made him a national celebrity and a topic of conversation everywhere. He wasn't just a gangster. He had become a household name, known for his opulence and his candid remarks. Conflicts with Aiello. Back in November 1925, Antonio Lombardo, Capone's consigliere, took the helm of the Unione Siciliana, a Sicilian-American benevolent society infiltrated by gangsters. Joe Aiello, who coveted the position himself, believed Capone had engineered Lombardo's appointment this infuriated Aiello, who resented non-Sicilian interference in the Union's affairs. Aiello severed ties with Lombardo and initiated a feud with Capone. This conflict lasted for years and the two never reconciled again. Infuriated by Capone's decision, Aiello formed alliances with his adversaries, including Jack Zuta, including together they plotted against Lombardo and Capone. They began planning in the spring of 1927. Aiello made multiple attempts to assassinate Capone. One infamous plot where he tried to end Capone's life was when he offered a chef money to poison Capone and Lombardo's soup. The chef, however, alerted Capone, who retaliated. Capone took his revenge by ordering his men to open a machine gun fire on Aiello's bakery in May 1927. This incident inflicted heavy losses on Aiello. His brother was also severely wounded. During the same year, Aiello also ordered numerous hitmen to kill Capone. However, unfortunately, these hitmen met their own demise. Aiello even put a $50,000 bounty on Capone's head, resulting in the deaths of several gunmen. Nothing stopped Aiello and his desperate attempts to pursue Capone and end his life. By the end of 1927, Aiello organized machine gun ambushes near Lombardo's home and a cigar store frequented by Capone. But these plots unraveled after police raids led to arrests, including Aiello's. Capone responded by stationing armed guards outside the police station where Aiello was held, anticipating his release and a potential confrontation. Reporters and photographers flocked to witness the tense standoff. End of conflict with Aiello Al Capone was infamous for delegating his ruthless tasks to others. His long-standing conflict with Joe Aiello persisted. Aiello was shrewd and decided to use some of Capone's men against him. 
little did Aiello know, it wasn't easy to overthrow Capone and his authority. He didn't know his plan would backfire. Capone was himself going to bring an end to this episode of betrayal and rivalry in his own way. By May 1929, one of Capone's loyal bodyguards, Frank Rio, uncovered a sinister plot hatched by three of Capone's own men, Albert Anselmi, John Scalise, and Joseph Junta. He instantly reported to his boss. These men, under the influence of Joe Aiello, aimed to overthrow Capone and take control of the Chicago outfit. Capone's response to this betrayal was shockingly brutal. He was a cold-blooded killer. He beat the three conspirators with a baseball bat and then ordered his bodyguards to execute them. This gruesome episode was even famously depicted in the 1987 film, The Untouchables. Some authors like Deirdre Baer and historians like William Elliot Hazelgrove have questioned the accuracy of this account. They suggest that it may have been embellished Others, such as Capone biographers Max Allen Collins and A. Brad Schwartz, argues that there is a basis of truth in the story. They believe it was propagated deliberately to bolster Capone's fearsome reputation. In 1930, after discovering Aiello's continued plotting against him, Capone decided it was time to put an end to the threat once and for all. Capone's men tracked Aiello to Rochester, New York, where they had planned to assassinate him. However, Aiello returned to Chicago before the plan could be executed. Stricken by constant fear and the loss of several of his associates, Aiello sought refuge in the Chicago apartment of Union Siciliana, treasurer Pasquale Pazzi Presto Prestigiacomo. However, he didn't know his life was still in danger and Capone was not going to spare him. On October 23rd, while exiting Presto Giacomo's building and attempting to enter a taxi, Aiello came under a hail of gunfire. A gunman on the second floor of a neighboring building opened fire with a submachine gun, hitting Aiello multiple times. In a desperate attempt to escape the shot, Aiello moved around a corner unknowingly into the line of fire from a second submachine gun positioned on the third floor of another apartment block. Tragically, Aiello was gunned down in this deadly crossfire, marking the end of his long-standing feud with Capone. Ruthless killer. Despite the perception of Al Capone as a generous benefactor and local celebrity among ordinary citizens, there was a dark side to him. One of a cold-blooded and ruthless killer. He didn't let anyone come in his way. He didn't let anyone betray him. Those who betrayed him always met a deadly consequence. While the exact tally of his victims will forever remain shrouded in uncertainty, it's widely believed that Capone not only personally carried out dozens of murders, but also ordered the deaths of hundreds more. One particularly harrowing incident emblematic of Capone's ruthlessness, unfolded in the spring of 1929. Capone had received intelligence that three of his associates were plotting betrayal. With characteristic cunning, he devised a sinister plan. He extended an invitation to all three men, luring them into a seemingly grand banquet. As the unsuspecting trio savored their meals and indulged in drinks, Little did they know the treacherous fate that awaited them. Capone's loyal bodyguards swiftly bound them to their chairs, rendering them helpless. With a chilling calmness, Capone himself grasped a baseball bat and proceeded to inflict a brutal and bone-shattering beating upon them. When Capone had finished with his merciless assault, the three men lay battered and broken. Their lives were brutally extinguished with gunshots to the head, and their lifeless bodies were unceremoniously discarded far from the city limits. One of the most infamous and chilling instances of a hit attributed to Capone was the merciless assassination that history now recalls as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which unfolded on February 14, 
1929. In this shocking event, one of Capone's ruthless henchmen, machine gun Jack McGurn, hatched a sinister plot to lure rival crime leader George Bugs Moran into a deadly trap. The plan devised by McGurn was a big one with deadly consequences. He made sure that there were no loopholes and that the plan was a complete success. However, fate took an unexpected twist. George Moran arrived at the appointed location just a few minutes later than anticipated, narrowly escaping the trap that awaited him. Nonetheless, the outcome was nothing short of gruesome. Seven of Moran's top associates, who had unwittingly gathered in that fateful garage, were mercilessly gunned down in cold blood. This brutal event describes the intensity and extent of competition to gain authority, violence and ruthlessness in the criminal underworld during Capone's reign. Federal intervention and tax evasion. Despite a long history of criminal activities, it was the infamous St. Valentine's Day massacre that was a severe blow to Al Capone. This event finally caught the attention of the federal government, who were determined not to let him go. The moment President Herbert Hoover caught wind of Capone's exploits, he personally heralded the cause for Capone's arrest. The government had a two-fold strategy against Capone. First, they aimed to gather evidence of Capone's prohibition violations and dismantle his illicit enterprises. Treasury agent Elliot Ness and his team of untouchables were tasked with this mission, conducting frequent raids on Capone's breweries and speakeasies. These relentless actions forced the closure of Capone's illegal operations and the confiscation of his ill-gotten gains, dealing a heavy blow to his empire. The next part of the government's mission was to uncover substantial evidence that Capone had evaded taxes on his vast income. Capone had taken great care to conduct his business dealings solely in cash or through intermediaries. There was a great chance that he could escape the charges. However, the IRS managed to unearth a damning ledger and secure witnesses willing to testify against him. On October 6, 1931, Capone found himself in the courtroom. He faced a staggering 22 counts of tax evasion and a staggering 5,000 violations of the Volstead Act, the primary prohibition law. The initial trial focused solely on the tax evasion charges. On October 17th, the verdict was out. Capone was found guilty on just five of the 22 tax evasion charges. The judge, determined not to let Capone slip through the cracks, imposed a sentence of 11 years in prison, along with $50,000 in fines and an additional $30,000 in court costs. Capone was utterly taken aback. He had believed he could sway the jury with bribes, just as he had done in numerous previous cases. Little did he know that this marked the end of his reign as a crime boss. At just 32 years old, he faced a harsh reality Justice had finally caught up with him. Could Capone survive the justice system's ultimate reckoning? Consequences. In the world of high-ranking gangsters, prison often offered a means to secure plush amenities by bribing wardens and guards. Since no law enforcement or authorities had ever even dared to touch him in all these years, people thought he would escape his consequences even this time. However, Al Capone found himself bereft of such luck. The government's intent was clear, to make an example out of him. Following the denial of his appeal, Capone was incarcerated at the Atlanta Penitentiary in Georgia on May 4, 1932. Yet, whispers soon circulated that Capone was receiving preferential treatment, leading to a significant decision. He was selected as one of the inaugural inmates at the newly established Maximum Security Prison on Alcatraz Island in San Francisco. In August 1934, Capone arrived at Alcatraz, bearing the designation of Prisoner Number 85. Here, there were no bribes to be had, no amenities to enjoy. 
Capone found himself in an entirely different prison landscape, surrounded by some of the most violent criminals, many of whom were eager to challenge the tough gangster from Chicago. As daily life grew increasingly brutal, Capone's body began to bear the toll of his long-standing battle with syphilis. Over the ensuing years, Capone's condition deteriorated rapidly. He suffered from disorientation, convulsions, slurred speech, and a shuffling gait as his mind steadily unraveled. After enduring four and a half years at Alcatraz, Capone was transferred to a hospital within the Federal Correctional Institution in Los Angeles on January 6, 1939. Several months later, he found himself relocated once more, this time to a penitentiary in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Then, on November 16, 1939, a pivotal moment arrived. Al Capone was granted parole, marking the conclusion of his tumultuous journey through the criminal underworld, prison life, and the debilitating effects of syphilis. The question remained, what would life beyond prison hold for the once feared gangster? Death Al Capone's health was in a decline. His worsening health conditions prompted his release from prison on November 16, 1939. Once he was released, he required immediate treatment for syphilitic paresis, a condition resulting from advanced syphilis. Unfortunately, Capone was going to pay a heavy price for his past. When he was rushed to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, they declined to treat him due to his notorious reputation. However, Union Memorial Hospital extended a compassionate hand and admitted him as a patient. Capone was touched by the care he received and expressed his gratitude by donating two Japanese weeping cherry trees to Union Memorial Hospital in 1939. After several weeks of both inpatient and outpatient care, Capone, now frail and ailing, left Baltimore on March 20, 1940, for his mansion in Palm Island, Florida. Luckily, in the same year, with the advent of mass-produced penicillin in the United States, Capone became one of the first American patients to undergo treatment with the new wonder drug. Although it couldn't reverse the damage to his brain, it did slow down the progression of the disease. By 1946, a physician and a psychiatrist in Baltimore examined Capone and reached a somber conclusion. He had the mental abilities of a 12-year-old child. In the final years of his life, Capone resided at his Palm Island mansion, where he cherished moments with his family, including his wife and grandchildren. On January 21, 1947, Capone suffered a stroke. Although he initially regained consciousness and showed signs of improvement, life did not spare him. Just when he showed some signs of recovery, he contracted bronchopneumonia. In the tragic events that followed, his heart failed as a result of apoplexy on January 22. Surrounded by his family, Capone passed away on January 25 in his home in Palm Island. A week later, his body was transported back to Chicago, where a private funeral was held. Initially interred at Mount Olivet Cemetery in Chicago in 1950, Capone's remains, along with those of his father, Gabriele and brother Frank, were relocated to Mount Carmel Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. It marked the final chapter in the life of a man whose name would forever be synonymous with crime empire. Impact in the media and popular culture. When Al Capone breathed his last, a headline in the New York Times declared, end of an evil dream. Capone's presence in the media and public eye was incredibly complex, just like his life, swinging between admiration and revulsion. During the era of Prohibition, which was repealed in 1933, some segments of the public believed that figures like Capone, who profited from the sale of illegal liquor, had been validated in their actions. However, one cannot forget that Al Capone 
was a ruthless gangster who was directly responsible for countless murders and the orchestrator of numerous assassinations. His despicable acts of violence build the dark core of his legacy. Capone's enduring image as a cold-blooded killer and the epitome of a mobster has transcended his own lifetime. It lives on through the countless films and books inspired by his life, ensuring that he remains an indelible figure in American history as the most notorious gangster of all time. Even today, when his name comes in front of people, glimpses of those gruesome times, gunshots and ruthless murders flash across the mind of all those who know him. Here comes an end to Al Capone's journey. His life story and crime empire is a tale of controversy, but his impact is profound and still persists. What do you think about Al Capone and his life? Do you think his tragic end was fair? Tragic end. On that note, we are wrapping up today's video. If you enjoyed today's journey back in time, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to share this video with your friends and family who would enjoy this intriguing story of Al Capone. Hit the subscribe button to keep an eye on our exciting content. We will see you soon 